No idea what this is, but it does look very old. An old wall. It just looks like the perimeter of a house. Public basketball hoop here. Overall, it's just a, a really cute start to this bushwalking adventure. Just down this path here will lead us down to the river, if my map reading skills are right. Now that we're on the right track, which is well marked, and just a stone's throw up the street, we can start the story of Sydney's forgotten fairyland. Not many Sydney siders remember that nestled in what is now the sprawling natural bushland of Lane Cove National Park was once a place of amusement, leisure, and a haven for local dancers. Attractions included a razzle dazzle, flying fox, and coin-operated silent movie booth acquired from White City Pleasure Grounds in Rushcutters Bay. There were tree swings, slippery dips, and a wooden pirate ship, with green lawns to laze about in and enjoy a picnic, plus riverside swimming, which is mostly how people arrived, by boat. Visitors would row their own, or make their way to the riverbank and wave down a ferry which were in no short supply along the once bustling Lane Cove River waterway. But Fairyland didn't start out like this. This began as the Swan family's riverside market garden, growing and selling strawberries and watermelons to passers-by on boats. Then in 1905, they started offering afternoon tea with strawberries and it became known locally as The Rest. The Swans saw their land's potential phased out the market garden and started adding amusements. So I am actually quite terrified of water and boats and rickety looking bridges, but in all reality, this bridge is used quite a lot. The Fairyland Adventure Walk actually makes up part of the historic Great North Walk. We're going to press on. This 250 kilometer trek links my hometown, Sydney, to my new digs up in Newcastle and was pioneered by some seriously cool 80s era explorers who spent all their spare time bush bashing, searching for existing old trails. Once used by the indigenous Garingai and Wallamadegal tribes, the original occupants of this region, prior to their displacement in 1788 by the European settlers. This vision to create one long journey would unite the two great cities and launch in time for Australia's 1998 bicentenary celebrations. And that's what led those determined dudes right through the abandoned remains of Fairyland, now overgrown with weeds and submerged beneath at times treacherously muddy swamplands. And it's right here in Lane Cove National Park where bushwalkers would get their first real taste of Sydney's wonderfully diverse plant species with pockets of subtropical rainforest alongside riverbank mangroves. However, this noble commitment to conservation isn't the only reason why so few remains can be found of Fairyland. So we've just reached this cute sign which has welcomed us to the site of Fairyland Pleasure Grounds. Pleasure Grounds were like, not amusement parks, they were more uh, picnic type grounds and often by rivers and all along the Lane Cove River there were little pleasure grounds dotted here and there. In this area there was Fairylands. There was also another one which is now the site of Hunters Hill High School and another one nearby in Hunters Hill which now makes up the exclusive enclave of Pulpit Point. There's some information I didn't know before about the swimming hole so I had imagined when I'd looked it up online that they had roped off an area of the river for people to swim in but it actually says here that a new swimming hole was built near the river and that a dam was constructed so that people could still swim at low tide. And it's interesting that it mentions low tide though because what ended up happening here is that a succession of floods in between 1967, 68 and 69 was what led to the closure of Fairylands. And it mentions here on the sign that as you walk through Fairyland that it's quite difficult to imagine just what this place would have been like and that once 
all this area would have been cleared and would have been grounds to just picnic and, and frolic upon. I mean, if you think about a pleasure garden, it was meant to bring people immense joy. And while it's beautiful to be here in the bush, this place just had rides and, and swings and, you know, little bird peeps were painted onto the onto the trees and a lot of that you won't see now because there was a big bushfire here in about 94. I have to check that. The 94 bushfires devastated the New South Wales east coast and tore through over 80% of the Lane Cove National Park, destroying what was left of fairyland, including the main attraction, the old dance hall shed. They've indicated here along the walk where you will see remnants of trees that are not native to this area. In this case, we will walk past the remnants of a phoenix palm. National Parks and Wildlife Association have done a lot to re-establish this area and, and regenerate the native uh, flora. So now we'll continue from the sign and we're going to go further into fairyland. Come join me. Oh. Well, here's something. It looks like the remains of an old car to me. So cars could actually come down here. There was an old vehicle access path. I don't know if it makes up part of the walk, but it could explain how this car got down here. But cars couldn't always gain access, depending on the weather conditions. This place was seriously flood prone. And before the days of four wheel drives, so when the water levels rose, the river was the only way to get here. And with cars becoming increasingly common to own, holidaymakers could travel further distances, so the appeal of Fairyland began to decline. But back in its heyday, Fairyland was very well known. In fact, it was one of the most popular destinations for Sydney siders to day trip, especially those from the North Shore. An excerpt from Australian Women's Weekly 1952 announced celebrations for a saucy Sadie Hawkins themed costume party. So it seems Fairyland was considered quite the cool venue to have hosted this event because this was a progressive American tradition, all a rage on college campuses. For one night, girls were encouraged to invite a bloke on a date and to dance. Fairyland also hosted Radio 2UW's Rock and Roll Spectacular Music Festival. The social pages of 1904's Splashes magazine spill some gossip on a club outing held at Fairyland, which was reportedly a huge success, revealing Miss McGowan surprised all the spectators at the ladies' cricket match with her fine, masterly strokes. Mr Rowe won the gentlemen's rowing race after a very exciting struggle. And after the ladies' 100-yard championship was run, an adjournment was made for tea, where a Mr Burns proposed a toast to the health of the ladies and drunk amidst great enthusiasm. After tea, games were indulged in till 10pm when the bugle called for home. For a more family-friendly version, Walter Baker, aged just 10 years, from Gladesville, describes a day at Fairyland in wonderful detail, confirming it to be, of the many holidays he has enjoyed, this was his favourite one to date. He writes, We found a landing place among the many boats moored there. We went then and found a suitable summer house. We played a number of games and I went on the razzle-dazzle twice. After lunch, we went on the aerial seesaw, circling swings and played all manner of games. But tea time soon came round and we went back to the summer house for tea. We were all sorry when we were told we would have to hurry as we had to reach Cockatoo Island before dark. And in a dramatic twist, a boy once fell from the razzle-dazzle with a motor convoy raised, transporting the injured lad to Royal North Shore. The signpost marks the site of the old wharf and says that Sundays was the best day for dancing. The wharf and dance hall are visible here However, the little beach has disappeared to make way for the mangroves. Nature has well and truly reclaimed this place and turned it into a new kind of pleasure ground for people to appreciate. These days, it's all active wear and hiking gear, but a century or so ago, you dressed up to come here. 
Rest and recreation were considered a luxury for most, and children were treated far less, so a trip to Fairyland was considered a really special occasion. And as for records of Fairyland's abandoned years between 1970 and 88, only one sole account seems to exist, and it's pretty epic. Some legend basically lived the urbexing dream when a visit back to Sydney sparked an unexpected memory. I returned to Sydney, it was around 25. New girlfriend and I just happened to be driving down Delhi Road. Had a flash of an old memory. Pulled up the car, said to her, I've been here before. She thought I was mad. I said to her, this looks like where Fairyland used to be. She started to think I was really crazed. Parked the car, jumped through the bushes, found the rock platform, and found the abandoned Fairyland sign, face down. Turn her over, was covered in painted pastel balloons with Fairyland across the top. Found the remnants of the turnstile, had fallen over and rotten, still had the admission prices painted on it. When I saw the playing fields, I, I could have cried. They were covered in long grass, up to me knees. Coaxed me girlfriend into tromping through what had been beautiful fields when I was young. We found the main pavilion, horridly overgrown, over the top with vines and weeds, yet you could still walk into it. At this point, I felt a presence in that deserted, lonely place. I turned, and an old gent wearing a straw hat and carrying a rifle was just metres behind me. He asked me what I was doing on his land. I replied, I'd come to see Fairyland, that I remember from my youth. He replied, Fairyland was a long time ago. Now I shoot rabbits here. You best leave before you catch a stray bullet. Well, we left immediately. Now, getting caught trespassing is a chance most urbexes are willing to take, but thankfully Australia's strict gun control laws have greatly reduced the risk of facing an armed, disgruntled caretaker or landowner. The memories I've made on this adventure are vastly different to those of OG Sydney siders lucky enough to experience the wonder of Fairyland, but they're certainly no less special. Actually, I imagine those who can remember Fairyland would be quite stunned to see it today, converted back to its rightful form, just as nature intended it. We've reached the end of what was once this grassy knoll and down to the end of the creek bed, which leaves into the mangroves and the swamps. This area is now notoriously inhabited by snakes in summer. Another bushwalker and photographer warned me, don't go too far especially later on in the season because there are heaps of snakes down here. I didn't uh, ask to determine what type of snake. I just, yeah, that's, that's enough info for me. And if people don't pause to read these signposts, then they won't even realise they're standing at one of Sydney's former trendiest destinations. Can you hear the Mr Whippy van? Just adds a certain ambiance to the area, doesn't it? <laughs> if you've made it to the end of this virtual journey, thanks heaps. Hope you've enjoyed it. Subscribe now if you want to catch more adventures and maybe see you on the next one. Peace out.